You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Excited to start today's episode. Ivan, please go ahead and introduce today's guest. Hey, I'm uh, Ivan Zach. Very excited to introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Roland Wessels. And I am butchering his first and last name, but he's from Netherlands, so I can't pronounce it as cool as he does it. Uh, he comes from the company St. Anna's Advice. And Dr. Roland Wessels is a veterinarian and communication strategist. He is a founder of St. Anna's Advice, uh, where he combines 20 years of communication experience with 25 years of veterinary practice experience. In 2000, he made the switch from the veterinary world to the business world. In early 2008, he created St. Anna's Advice, the successful companion animal veterinary clinic. The purpose is bringing human skills in animal health. Also, Roland is an author of two veterinary communication books. Roland, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. So uh, tell us a little bit about it. What is St. Anna's advice? You told us this is not uh, something from the Catholic Church. It's the name of the street where the clinic is at. Absolutely. absolutely. What was the switch and uh, how did you pivot your career into this communication world? Yeah. Uh, let me first apologize uh, to all the listeners uh, for my poor uh, English pronunciation. I'm sorry, I'm Dutch. And on the other hand, Dutch people are pretty straightforward. So I apologize for that uh, up front as well. But um, coming back to your question, you know, when I graduated in the last century, because you said I'm a very old vet, I am, I graduated in the last century, I found out in practice that the species we need to know most about is the human being. So I was trained on my veterinary faculty of the University of Utrecht to deal with dogs and cattle and horses and goats, but I was never taught how to deal with people. And I found out that in practice, 80% of your time, you're spending with this special breed, this special type of, of animal, the human being. So then I started studying communication science, besides having studied veterinary medicine. And I found out if you apply the rules and, and the principles of communication in your veterinary clinics, things start working for you. So that's what I started to do from then. And yes, then I started an agency. It's a long story. And I, um, I called my accountant and I said, what name should I give it? And he said, oh, just name it after the street where it's founded. And that was one of the worst advices that I got from my accountant. So don't ask accountants for advice when it comes to finding a name for your <laughs> clinic or whatever. Ask them only for advice when it comes to money issues. Yeah, numbers, financial numbers, are, yeah, are, yeah, they're, yeah. they're good for that. But yeah. creative stuff, um, my CFO at my company, I don't let him get involved in that type of stuff. So a question for you. So what was the pivot like going from you know, running a day-to-day -day veterinary practice, being in veterinary medicine to now being, you know, focused on communication and behavior change. That, that's quite the shift. It's not as much as we think it is. You know, as veterinarians, we have to deal with human beings. And, and I found out that as a matter of fact, we have to do three things every day, all the day in our practices. First of all, we have to make animals better. That's the first thing we have to do. Evidence-based, state-of-the-art, tailor-made veterinary medicine. And we're extremely good in that. But secondly, we have to make people happy, make clients happy, make our staff happy, and last but not least, make ourselves happy. Because I've learned that happy clients don't bite. You know, so make people happy, make animals better, and last but not least, make a living. It's not a hobby, it is a business. So I found out that I was only trained in one direction of uh, the beautiful profession, because I'm a very proud vet, I think being a veterinarian is having the most wonderful profession in the world. But I feel like I felt a little bit crippled by not having the knowledge on how to deal with people and how to deal with the business side. So that's where I start learning this. And then I start to implement it in our veterinary practice, which is has become like a laboratory for client behavior. And I found out, and probably the listeners will recognize this, there's nothing as predictable as the behavior of 80% of your clients. 80% of your clients in campaign animal clinics, but also in farm animals, are just very nice, lovely, dedicated animal owners that want the best for their animal. 20% are the special cases. 
And what happens in our brain is that we focus as veterinarians always on the exception to the rule. We're focused on to see not what's right, but what's wrong. When I walk in the city, I don't know if it also applies for you, but when I walk in the city, just do some shopping with my wife, we only see crippled dogs. We're so trained on seeing what's wrong that we're not trained on what, in seeing what's right. So the same applies for, for communication. We're so focused on the Dr. Google, uh, the price seeker, uh, the one who's this, the one who's that, that we forget about the nice and lovely clients that we have in our, uh, our beautiful practices. And if we serve them a little bit better by managing the communication better, because communication for me is, is not a goal in itself, it's, it's a way to achieve a goal, then things start working for us. So as a matter of fact, it's that easy. It's really fascinating, actually. And, you know, I, I'm kind of triggered on this idea of being focused on the 20%, the bad 20%, and the lens that that must give veterinarians on the rest of their clients that are the 80% that they're really lovely people. And so that makes me think about, oh, if I'm a stressed out veterinarian and I'm only looking for the, the negative, you know, this, this may be one of the big problems. Oh, absolutely. I fully agree on that. I train my staff in my clinic um, that we have like different people and uh, we divide them in four C's. So first of all, the most important person in the clinic is the C of the colleague. Please pay attention to your colleagues. Treat your colleagues as your best clients and then things start working for you. Then secondly, we have in our clinic what I call clients. And clients are very loyal people. They come back, you have a relation with them. They're willing to spend money. They do the best for their animal. It could be farmers, could also be uh, dog owners or cat owners. And they're just lovely people. You know, when they come in, you're just happy because uh, you see that they love their animal and you can be a part of that uh, health and happiness. And then you have the customers. And the customers, they come in whenever they choose. You know, these, these people say, oh, yeah, sorry, I haven't been to your clinic for three years now, but the dog is having diarrhea. Can I please come in? And I train my staff that, of course, you always have to help people, but focus more on your, uh, your clients than on the customers. And then within the group of the customers, there's your last C's, and I call them the complainers. And whatever you do, Sean, whatever you, you do, they always complain. They complain about money. They complain about not being able to come to your clinic. They complain about this, that. They made complaining their lifestyle. As a matter of fact, at least in the Netherlands, uh, science shows that probably one in seven, 15% of the population is the complaining uh, type. And it's not only your mother-in-law. That's very interesting. Yeah. So uh, among those, uh, I mean, you kind of went to it, but where do you think veterinarians are failing more? And then, uh, you know, I, I know that the, the four C's, I really like that there's colleagues, but there's peers colleagues. There's those that report to you. So in the, in the clinical setting, there's a you know, there's hospital manager, there's peers, veterinarians, let's say if I'm a vet, which I am, and then there's there's nurses, and then there's staff, there's sort of general sort of assistants. I don't know if it's the same in Netherlands. And then there's clients. Where do you think veterinarians are failing the most in the communication style? Because people could be not all the same with all clients. You could be the nicest person with clients and they love you, but then you're an asshole in the back with your with your staff. So where do you think that veterinarians need more uh, attention or it's very sort of personal yeah it's all um, um, very good questions um ivan I, I think it's all about focus focus on the people that bring you energy give your energy to the people that really react on your energy so it doesn't matter if it's the, the clinical director or the big manager or the student nurse you know what you give that's a very important principle in communication what you give is what you get so if you're nice to people uh, without knowing, people become nice to you. It's called the re reciprocity principle. What you give is what you get in 80% of the times. And the 20% complainers and difficult people, you know, they will give something back that you were not asking for. But focus on the lovely people. Focus on your colleagues because uh, teamwork makes a dream work, you know. Um, outside wins uh, start within. You, you can only have become very successful in veterinary business if you have the good team. Absolutely. It's not like, um, mm, I'm the doctor, you're the nurse. No, it's we are the team. And from the client perspective, at least in the Netherlands, I, I, 
I can't talk about the situation in America because I, uh, I have been there, but not uh, so much that I can, can give you a clear view on that. But in the Netherlands, you know, from the client's perspective, they don't really care who's in front of them. If it's a highly educated nurse or a veterinarian, they care that people in front of them are caring, that they care about the animal, that they listen to the client, that they uh, they are allowed to ask questions, that they feel like the team is giving them this feeling of a warm bath. And it's not like a doctor who's able to give that more than a nurse. It's all about the team. Where do we feel? Go back to your, your question. I think, to be honest, we don't know. We are uh, led by our mistakes. So you go into practice and then you get this horrible Mrs. Johnson who's always complaining. And you think like, oh, whoa, hey, this, this client is really horrible, you know, and I have to save the client because otherwise the manager is getting mad at me. But, you know, there's no such thing as client is king. I don't know if you have that in the US that people say, oh, client is king. At least in my book, clients are kings whenever they behave like clients. If they don't behave nice to my staff, if they don't behave nice to their dogs, they're not my clients. Don't get me wrong. If an animal is in need, an animal, not the client, the animal is in need, I will always help. I'm a veterinarian. But I do make the difference in this. You know, if people are not nice to us, if people are not empathic to us, if people shout horrible things to us, we don't consider them as a client. You know, in SmartFlow days, uh, we had this rule because we had a couple of people that were really rude to my team. And uh, we had a rule. Uh, so in, in, in North America, at least what I've heard, they said not, not the client is king, but the client is always right. That's the saying. Mm -hmm. And we had a statement inside of the company, the client is not always right. I just made it very clear. And this is why I had such a support from my team because I, I said it to several customers. I said, I don't care about one more account with the smart flow if you sign up or not. If I lose one team member, that's way more painful for me than losing one customer. I said, I'm not going to lose a team member over this account. So that was very, very important to me. I think that's a very important to have it. And, and by the way, I don't have customers. A lot of veterinarians say, I have customers. There are people in the lovely city where I live that come to my veterinary clinic uh, to buy veterinary care, but they're not mine. It's up to them how to choose if they want my services or the ones of my colleagues. So the thing that I have to do is, is make a good connection with the people that I want to come in. And I think that's very important. And you're absolutely right. You know, we're so, we're losing clients. You know, uh, it's all about the staff in the end. It is all about at least what I think the human uh, being in veterinary practice. It's your own people, it's your clients, and it's yourself. Yeah, it's so interesting. So I, I wanted to jump in and say that I think that these principles that we're talking about transcend borders and and, and I think they're the same regardless of where in the world you're at, especially they'd be true in North America. So I think it's really fascinating. I think the way that you you view kind of the four C's, I think it's really interesting. And, you know, before we started the show, we were talking about, you know, kind of what, what makes good communication and the, you call them the four A's. So Roland, can we maybe go there next? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, it took me years and years to find out because... Let, let me be clear, communication science like veterinary science is a full science, you know. There are books, there, there are huge amount of books and publications on communication. But if you take a look at veterinary communication, it's probably half a meter in my uh, uh, library where uh, kidney in cats is five meters, you know. Uh, so there's a lot of science, a lot of communication science that could be really easy uh, brought into veterinary medicine, but we forgot to do it. And, and I found out by reading all these books and, and, and also going to all these lectures on communication that if you really try to, to bring it back to its uh, essentials, it's about two principles. The first two principles we already discussed, the 80-20 rule, which is very important. And the other one was the reciprocity rule or principle, which you give what you get. So these are principles that are very, you need to be very aware of that, that yes, 80-20 uh, rule, four nice customers and one challenge. 
and that is going to be your life. You're going to have four nice customers in your consultation room and then one challenge. And most of the time it goes right. Once in a while it goes wrong. So that's, that's very important. If you really take a look at communication itself, maybe this sounds strange, but by far the most important tool in communication is listening. Learn to listen. Learn to listen what people really say. I think the biggest problem in veterinary medicine is we, we listen to give an answer where we should listen to get information. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, we're so trained on our vet schools, question, answer, question, answer, question. And that's what the professors play uh, with us all the day. And then when we leave vet school, we think that question, oh, answer, question, answer. No, try to listen to get information. That's, you know, I just finished one of the courses uh, on um, leadership. And uh, it's interesting because I'm taking this year education now on leadership and uh, the most important tools that they are teaching there is about discovering who you are, how you behave. And active listening was a huge part. We did these exercises where they constantly trying to break you from coming up with an answer while you're listening to the person. And there's really cool tricks that you can do about it. Like when you're listening, try to think about how would you tell the story that someone is telling you instead of, you know, listening and trying to answer. And the same thing in all the meetings, I'm trying to practice it right now because as a leader, you know, I'm running an organization, Sean is running an organization. We always have an answer for everything. You're coming into a meeting, you're like, this is a problem. This is how I'm trying to solve it. And then what do you guys think? That's already failed. I think Simon Sinek talks about this. It's like, that's already failed at that point because you didn't solicit their opinion. So they don't think that you listen to them. So it's so important. But I know you were talking about four A's and active listening was just the first A. So what are the other three A's in that? Yeah, so, so absolutely. The first is active listening. The second one is always ask questions. Ask questions. That's the second one. If you really listen and you don't understand, ask the question, what do you exactly mean by you're very this or that? Or you ask the question just to be sure that you're on the same page. So if I got you right, Mrs. Johnson, and you're really worried about this. So asking questions and really good listening, these are, at least in my book, very important tools in to become a great communicator. The third A is adapt to the other one. So if the other one in the consultation room is a professor, you use different words than when it's a child. And by asking questions, you find out what the level is where you can communicate. And you can ask, before I explain to you this diabetes, or before I explain to you how this x-ray, have you ever seen an x-ray before? And if the guy says, yes, yes, I'm a professor in radiology and by the way, your x-rays are underexposed, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened to me when I was a young vet. I had that too. Ask questions <laughs> and adapt to the other one based on the questions. And then your last A is always be NEC. And this sounds a little bit strange. NEC is my football club. But NEC stands for always try to be nice, which is sympathetic. Always try to be E, empathic but also clear, nice, empathic, and clear. These three things, 30% nice, 30% empathic, 30% clear, and then 10% you can change on whoever is in front of you. So Mrs. Johnson, who's 80 years now, you give her a little bit of em more empathy, and maybe the, the owner who's not really convinced by your advice, maybe give a little bit extra of clearness. What I see in practice is, a lot of young nurses and young vets, super nice, super empathic, but not very clear to the customer. And very old vets like me, not nice, not empathic anymore, but extremely clear. Mrs. Johnson, the only thing you have to do is put these pills in the cat and everything's going to be all right. Am I clear? <laughs> so funny. Roland, we make a promise to our listeners to try to keep our episodes at 20 minutes. But I've got another question that I think is important before we get to our last ones. This has been a fascinating and inspiring episode, but what are some tools? What are some areas of, of advice that you can give our listeners? You said you wrote a couple of books. Are they going to help our listeners? Please uh, now jump into the self-promoting 
portion of the podcast that you told us that you wouldn't do? No, no. B books can help. And yes, I wrote two books. Uh, but to be honest, you know, most people learn by doing it in practice. So a book is a very good thing to to go and look uh, in and, and, and if you have a problem that you want to solve. But my number one advice is train your communication skills. And it's not that hard. Maybe it's a little bit scary, but it's not that hard. Find yourself a communication trainer and try to to make a structure in your conversation. Do your consultation always, or in 80% of the time, step by step. Just general introduction. Hi, Mrs. Johnson. How are you? Good to see you today. And then go to and maybe the next step, finding out the needs of Mrs. Johnson. How can I help you, Mrs. Johnson? And, oh, vaccination of your dog. That's great. But before we go on, are there other things that you want to discuss with me today? So just do a structured approach in your consultations, dividing by asking the right questions and listening, active listening to your owner, and train yourself. If you train yourself, I've, I've trained now thousands of veterinarians, and they all come back to me and say, really, it really helped me. You know, I did my thing based on, on the mistakes that I made in the consultation room, and now I have a clear view on taking this step by step by step, and I've trained it, and I feel very comfortable. It's the same in the end as training your surgical uh, skills. It's the same as training your diagnostic skills, making an x-ray. Training your communication skills can be done, so please do it. So perfect. So we we like to wrap up the same way every time. Yeah. So first question we've got for you is a book, a TED Talk, a YouTube video, something that you found inspiring or interesting along your path in life so far. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Ivan already mentioned him, Simon Sinek. I really would re recommend everybody to take a look at the work of Simon Sinek because I think uh, he says some real essential things that are very applicable in our veterinary business. So that's one person that's that's one of my heroes and that i would recommend every listeners to take a look at as far as um, reading uh, concerned of course my books but maybe one book that i really would recommend is thinking fast and slow yeah uh, which is written by a nobel prize winner yeah and it's a great book and it explains in a very very understandable way how our brain works because in the end that is what I think is really important, that we as veterinarians and vet nurses know more about, say, the mental processes, the psychological processes that happen in our brains, as well as in that of our customer or client. So these two, two recommendations. And then we usually ask for a recommendation on the guests that we can invite to this podcast. Who do you think in your network could be interesting to be a guest here? Oh, they're, they're a bunch of people very interesting to listen to. But I would really recommend uh, Dave Nichol, Dr. Dave Nichol yep. uh, from the UK. I think um, he and I were on the same page here. Uh, uh, we're all about empowering people, uh, empowering veterinarians, veterinary professionals, to do a better job by knowing more about the human being. Um, so I would really recommend that. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.